from Ball State University in partnership with Cardiff Metropolitan University. Produced by the creative storytellers in Ball State Sports Link. This is Transatlantic Storytelling 2020. A country with a population just over 3 million, Wales has 870 miles of jaw-dropping coastline views, contemporary cultural hotspots, unforgettable encounters with nature, and thousands of years of history. But just as important, the identity of Wales also comes from its passion for sport. I'm very proud of what Wales has achieved. We have such a big history, such a long history. You support a team because your dad went and his dad went and his dad before that. Sport is escapism and that's really true in Wales. When we go to sport we, we come together, whether we're from the north of Wales or the south of Wales, whether we're young or old, we all come together, a, a big sporting community and we don't worry for that 90 minutes or that 80 minutes of battle. There's certainly a great drive to get people in the sport here uh, and there's a pathway for them, there's a way that they can really progress. Cardiff Met attracts students from all over the globe, including next door from England. Will Godwin is a student at Cardiff Met who started his athletic career as a triathlete and rower until two freak accidents changed his life. Any opportunity he was given to do any sort of sport, didn't really matter what it was, he would have a go and enjoy it. I had to be the best always as a kid. I had to win everything. I used to think I was the fastest in primary school up until another kid beat me and then I was really not happy about it. But yeah, competitive, it's just all the time. He's just my William and I'm very, very grateful that he's still alive and I've still got him. A very self-driven, I mean, if the past two years anything, yeah. It's all had to come from me. I've been given like opportunities and I've just taken them because I can't not anymore. I first met Will at the start of college, so we are about 16, 17. I like making people laugh and I think he likes making people laugh as well. He's always smiling, he's always joking about, uh, he, he's, he's nice to everyone. You know, going out and running about is the way he gets, gets through stuff, so if he's told he can't, that's like having a caged animal. He's such a warrior, honestly. Like, if nothing will put him down at all. He could be struck by lightning and he'd still get up and dust himself off and go again. Like, n nothing will put him down. Just normal day, did college. Came back to college for six aside football. Trained swimming for an hour. And then the rest is, rest is what it is, isn't it? I mean, I unlock my bike, as I always do. Checked the lights, made sure they were on. Just started cycling down that road. And uh, the road goes on a long, gradual turn, but you can see at least 100 feet in front of you at every point. And I'd say that's the last clear memory. He hit me 60, 70 miles an hour, and I've flown back into the windshield and then flown 50, 75 feet forwards, skidded along the road. My bike and all the thing, everything was spread over about 100 meters. The first responder was a, an off-duty nurse. She was heading back from her shift. 
So I was really lucky because uh, my head was bleeding out on the road. I might have felt a bit of tingling, but I've not. I can't. I couldn't say for certain. I remember when my mum arrived on the scene. It was very dark. He was uh, lying on the side of the road. I felt quite sick um, because I'm a nurse. I was I was going through those like well he's talking, which was reassuring to me. And uh, she looked down at me, and I could hear her voice. And I said, William, Mummy's here. And I was like, Mum, I can hear you, but I can't see you. And she was like, that's because you're looking at the road, darling. And I was like, ah. OK, and at that point, she sort of knew it was still me, and I was still, I was still with it. But I was battered beyond belief, to be fair. When we got to A&E, he was a trauma call, so everybody who needed to be there was there, which is brilliant. Then I heard what the extent of the injuries were. My best mate came and visited. It shocked him because he'd never seen me in that state before. It was brutal, honestly. Like his face was like covered in gashes and scrapes. It was, it was horrible to look at. He had a fractured skull and a laceration to his head. He had a subdural hematoma, so a bleed into his head. He fractured both his scapula. He fractured one rib on his left side and five ribs on his right side. He had a fractured sternum and a collapsed lung. When you break your number one rib, uh, it's covered in a load of nerves. And when you break that, you have an 80% chance of losing the entire function of your arm. And with my brain injury as well, they've seen people never walk again from that. I mean, it was one of the benefits, I guess, of being 17 and as fit as I was. I just bounced back. Take it gently, don't rush anything. And get back to fitness as quickly as you can. It was purely self-driven. He wanted to be back on his bike. He wanted to be back racing. You know, he didn't even want to be stuck around doing nothing. You could kind of tell that he was just itching. That he just wanted to get back out there. He had a strenuous rehab um, set by his personal trainer. Um, I decided to do it with him. I thought he was going to be struggling through it the entire time, but it turned out he was still way stronger than me. <laughs> so it was lifting more weights than I was almost three weeks after the crash. So I reckon six months was where I started to see one, my physique changed back to something that it used to look like. I was also told later by a physio, I do not have the markings of someone with an event such as that. We then called myself indestructible. Thirteen months, almost exactly. I thought it was going to be an easy session. And then our coach came up and said, oh, we've got um, a Welsh indoors in November. We need to start training for that. So he did, he decided to do two times 750 max efforts. And the first one I did, it was a really good split. I was so chuffed. And I tried to keep with my friend who then started and he was next to me. I was thinking, this is, this is just hard. It's just hard work. And we got all the way to the end. He then got up from his machine while I just put the machine back and I was like, phew, it was hard work. And I sort of just bent over in the seat and that's when I black out. I don't remember anything from there. Analyzing heart rhythm. Do not touch the patient. Shock advised. Charging. Stay clear of patient. Deliver shock now. Shock delivered. That was another phone call. And she said, 
while he was rowing and he stopped breathing. We had the shout on the radio and there was a first aid we needed to, um, needed to go and see what was going on. And then one of the rowers came down and said, someone's unconscious, can you just come and check him out? And so I started walking upstairs to where he was. Um, then another rower appeared, said no, he's like, he's gone, he's not breathing. So I ran back to get the defib. Seconds after they just defibbed me, I shot straight up. Uh, and I was all like, whoa, what's going on? They coaxed me back down to lying down. And I came around the second time and that, that's when I start remembering things and it's, there are paramedics around me. And they tell me, you've had a cardiac arrest. The road accident was nothing <laughs> compared to that. I didn't feel at the time it was as severe as it probably was. Um, he later told me about a week later that um, like he, he genuinely died and <laughs> they'd revived him. He was very lucky that there was a, a lifeguard there who clearly knew what he was doing, even though he'd never done it before, bless him. He did it and it was successful and I'm very grateful to him. I still can't believe it, like seeing him walking around now, like thinking like he's alive because of what we did. It's mad, this is the exact one I've seen in my life, but I didn't see it at any point. So this is the first time I've actually seen it. As soon as I was out of hospital, I did go and sit on the rowing machine. I knew I couldn't do anything with it, but I just wanted to be there. It took me a while to go back up to where it happened. I can imagine like, for him, going to sit back on the row is quite relieving in a way. It's pretty surreal being here, I'll be honest. It's weird. I haven't sat in the same spot and gone, wow. And I still couldn't tell you why it happened. He was worried initially that he wouldn't be able to do sport. And I said, I'm sure you know, we'll get through it, whatever, whatever it is, we'll deal with it. I mean, there's no one that deserves that, of course, but certainly not Will. Uh, the chances of it happening are very, very small, but I know that now I've had one, mine are now doubled. If you have another cardiac arrest outside hospital, you're unlikely to survive. So it was recommended that he had an internal a uh, cardiac defibrillator. Once my heart goes into an unorthodox rhythm, so an irregular rhythm, it acts as a defibrillator. I mean, there wasn't really a choice. It was, you know, do we risk it and he could die, or do we have this put in and at least I know he's safe? I'm still getting used to it. This is, it's about a six month turnaround for actually psychologically getting through it. I think I've accepted the fact that I'm now living with it. I'm getting my fitness back, it's just, it's a totally different way of doing it. It limits me so that I can't lift weights above my head. So unfortunately I can't go back to rowing. I can't do any contact sports because of the risk of injury to the device. So now it is predominantly tennis. And then I'm still training triathlon on the side. I'm still me, but there is an element of caution there that wasn't there before. I'd love to have his heart and his drive. He's taught me not to take anything for granted. To have that commitment level, especially after you've been knocked back, it's just, it's insane. Some people would say everything happens for a reason. Those are two messed up reasons, and I can't say that I am satisfied with those reasons, but it's almost stopped for me twice now. And that just sort of puts it in perspective. It's like, I need to go for it. I definitely want to take sport as far as I can go. I definitely want to work in elite sport. I'm proud of everything he achieves. He's just my William and I'm very, very grateful that he's still alive and I've still got him. You know, every now and then I do think, what if he had died, what if, I, you know. But I, I, he didn't, he's here and Nothing's going to stop him.
treat every moment as if it could be last, essentially. If dreams don't work unless you do, it's very applicable to this. Probably say I'm most proud of the fact that I'm just, I keep going. I don't stop. Because if you stop, what's the point? Student at Cardiff Met's School of Art and Design, Lydia Hitchens grew up playing netball. Now a professional player, she has the goal of playing in the 2022 Commonwealth Games. I went to netball through school, but it wasn't really a main focus of mine through education and then um, I started with a local club in Cardiff, CTK and from then it kind of spiralled so I joined a women's club, played in a women's league so it's a lot more physical and yeah I was kind of exposed to another level and then it kind of just gradually built up from there. I was involved in inter-club tournaments, inter-county tournaments and then Welsh Hub, which then fed into kind of the Wales setup. So I'd probably say about I was age 15. So it's kind of, it is similar to basketball, but the court is split into uh, thirds, and there's a semicircle in each end of the third. So there's seven players on a team. Two of the attackers were able to shoot. There's also a size difference as well. So usually the goalkeepers. The defenders and the shooters at either end are a bit taller and then um, the mid-quarter the quick, smaller um, athletes. But yeah, I mean it's so competitive, it's non-contact sport, you've only got three seconds to release the ball, so yeah, it's really quick. I think but as you grow older, the more experience you get, the more physical it is and yeah, it's awesome. Netball is the leading female participation sport in Wales and that's really important for our um, role modelling effect to try and increase the number of young women and um, young females that are part of this sport movement and um, to, to get them engaged. The more we can show young women the sport and the fact that it's not just about exercises, like really enjoying it as well. That's massive. We have Netball Europe tournaments every year, so that's age groups and also with the seniors. So we've travelled kind of UK based for that, Aberdeen, we've been to Northern Ireland and England as well, but then abroad we've been to South Africa, I've been to Durban, um, that was an amazing experience with the under 21 squad. Being able to see different cultures and to be somewhere that I maybe wouldn't have the opportunity of going because Netball has taken me there basically, so that's been really cool. So Lydia played in the under 21s age groups for Wales. She was training with their group, I was training with the seniors, so we often kind of played against each other. I think immediately you could sense that she was going to have a future uh, in, in a Welsh dress. Susie is such a legend in the netball world. You know, she's a lecturer at Cardiff Met. She's our first team coach with the uni. But also, yeah, I train with her with Wales as well. So when she got her 100th cap, which is amazing, I stepped on court with her and I got my first cap. So that was really special. Yeah, and hopefully I can get to 100 like Susie. <laughs> Lydia stepped on the court in a senior uh, Wales netball dress for the first time, which was so, so special because Lydia came back from a, a, an ACL injury. It was the summer of the World Youth Games, um, the World Youth Cup. Yeah, selected for the team. I was so excited. It was a training game. I was playing at goal attack. I literally changed direction. My knee kind of 
caved inwards and I didn't feel anything because I think people feel different things but walked out of the, the sports centre and then the next morning I really started to feel it so unfortunately um, I did lose out on going to the World Youth Cup that year so that was pretty devastating but I spent a lot of hours in the gym by myself which was really strange because we have SNC sessions where we're together as a group twice a week and then we have on court sessions um, so we're with each other all the time so it was quite a lonely and dark place but yeah I just kind of was pretty optimistic about the whole thing and I didn't want the, the knee injury to stop me so I kind of the first time I was able to get back onto court, you know, down the local Cardiff League, it was, yeah, it was a great feeling, quite emotional as well. I study textiles, but I specialise in surface design. So it's mainly drawing motifs, drawing sketches up in my sketchbook, and then I translate that digitally then, um, so it, it can produce like a, a print on fabric. The creativity that she shows in her art degree and her, doing her textiles, I actually think she brings some of that onto the court as well. Her flair uh, that she probably demonstrates in uh, the textiles and what, the work that she does, she actually does it in a different way to others on the court, so I think that's fascinating. I did my dissertation on fast fashion and consumer habits. Basically, fashion you see on the runways and at big fashion weeks, the looks are then copied and sold for lower prices. So obviously it's so accessible for us, but realistically, like the garments don't last and it hasn't got that quality that it would at the high end. It does make you realise how much fast fashion brands are so accessible to us. You know, things are cheap, it's great for students, but we kind of need to realise what it's doing to our planet as well. So my next step is to get into a job, maybe a graduate job, and to network and see how a business runs, but I would eventually like to start off on my own and set up a business on my own. So yeah, I definitely would say netball would help me because netball's really helped with my networking and confidence to approach people. I hopefully see myself focusing on a business that's kind of related around sustainability. Rugby is often referred to as the sport which unites Wales. After a horrific injury ended his promising playing career, Harrison Walsh shifted his focus. Now the world record holding thrower is aiming for the 2021 Paralympic Games. I started about eight or nine I think and a lot of kids start younger than that. And I never played touch rugby, uh, I went straight into full contact stuff. I remember watching rugby on TV and I think just surrounding every, everyone around, all the adults around you just being so like passionate about this one thing on the TV, sh shouting and screaming at the TV, singing at the TV, you know, kind of, kind of gets you interested in it. Here it's, in, 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 in Wales it matters hugely. You know, if Wales win an international event, everybody feels a bit better when they walk down the street and go to work on a Monday morning. Similarly, of course, if you lose, particularly at rugby, tend to be rather long faces. Wales obviously is a very passionate place, there's obviously rugby itself, my story, having played rugby as a kid, everything is about rugby. You grow up looking at, looking at the Six Nations and wanting to play in the Principality, that's what everyone wants to do, they've all got the, all the Welsh rugby jerseys and I think instilling that passion into me and, and people around me, like everyone within sport in Wales is very passionate about the country that they're competing for and competing in. I wanted to play more and more and then I got into a club and then that's how it started really. I just loved rugby, I just, I loved more about the environment you're in. In Wales, you, and especially if you're a rugby player like I was and like a lot of my friends were, it becomes who you are, it becomes your identity really and that's what, that's almost what it is, is your identity, the sport. So when you walk down the street, you know, obviously it's, I come from a smaller village and 
you walk down the street and people know who you are instantly. They know you're the rugby player. You know, I've also got a brother who plays rugby and you know the two of them play rugby. And that, that, that's almost how it is. And that's, that's the first people, thing people ask you. So I would say it's, it becomes your identity. I was playing for Swansea at the time and it was just a normal game. And I was just, it was the last play of the game and I got a bad pass and I, I go to carry the ball and I do like any other time and basically my knee just snaps under me and lots of horrible stuff happen and I'm there left laying on the floor looking up at the sky going what you know what am I going to do knowing instantly at that time that there's no way I can play this again. So I went into the, um, to the hospital on the Monday, just before I went into the Ospreys, and they basically said to me, look, your knee's fine, it'll be fine. Your, the movement in your foot and the feeling in your leg, it'll come back, don't worry about that. Um, you'll be training in three weeks' time. So obviously hearing that, I'm absolutely ecstatic. This is gonna be amazing, I'm gonna, uh, it's only a little stumble, it's fine. Um, get into the Ospreys then probably an hour later. My mum had come along with me, and I'm only 18 at this time. We're sitting in the room and I'm telling her that it'll be fine. Like we've been told it's gonna to be fine. And then the first words the surgeon said was, uh, this is not about playing rugby ever again. This is about getting you to walk. Like you, you probably will never walk again properly. We talked about that loss of identity and you know you almost feel all of that in one go when you're on the floor you know what the hell do you do when you you grew up in a culture where the first thing people ask you is you like how's rugby going and you're like well i don't play it anymore and you know that constant emotion coming back to you um it, it's hard i was lying on the sofa not being able to do anything i needed to find something so i tried all sorts of different things just to see what i actually like to do I never really found something until then I started training again and then I realised training is what I love. It's, it, it's building towards something. Around that time I was coaching rugby, still trying to stay involved but I was really struggling with the fact that I couldn't just go out there and do it. I wasn't allowed, I could but I wasn't allowed. I was coaching the kids and there was, a, there was another coach alongside me and he just asked me like, I, like, are you disabled? Do you, did you, know, do you know that? And I'd never thought of it because obviously I'd gone through a professional rugby you know, environment from 16. I'd got all the best physio, tra and I, they'd never ever once said anything about it. But the fact was I couldn't move my foot or couldn't, couldn't feel anything from the knee down. I'd never ever considered it. And you'd think that might be a bit stupid, but you know, when you're really pushing and striving for something, you don't ever take a backward step sometimes. So I didn't know. And essentially I got put in touch with uh, DSW, they're an they're a athletics team here and they work alongside um, British Athletics with Parasport and um, the Paralympic Games. So I went along and they were like, yeah, well, you, of course you are. <laughs> You're of course classifiable and you can, you, can, you can really make a, you know, a job at this, you can really um, have a go. I was terrible. Oh, I was terrible. <laughs> but, but that's what I loved. It was something else I could do. Like, I always said that it didn't matter what I was going to do. I needed to put something into it. I needed to put what I'd put into rugby into something else. It, uh, we talked about it before. It could, it could have been watercolour painting. I don't know. It could have been, I could have been a groundsman. But I was going to be the best groundsman I could. And as soon as I found that avenue, then nothing could stop me. And I, you know, I've, I've not looked back since. I love it. So for someone to, to gain an injury at the pinnacle of their career that could have, well, was career ending for his rugby career, to, to be able to turn that into a positive takes such a big character, takes such a big personality to be able to do that. And he's run with it, you know, he, he's gone, right, okay, yeah, my rugby career is over, it's heartbreaking, I hate the fact that I can't play rugby anymore, but all the knowledge that he's learnt um, and is still learning to transfer that so quickly into a new sport and a new career path for him is amazing.
up until last year, really, I struggled watching rugby and even even watching my brother, you know, get his kit bag ready. I just felt like I wasn't wasn't done with the sport. But over the last year, I really found my place in athletics, and I, I found a lot of love for it. And and now I've I've come to really terms with with the rugby. But for now, to him to turn that dream and passion into something else and a new focus to have. I think his, his ability to do that is, is tremendous and amazing and a massive inspiration for some of the youngsters coming through. I think it's almost the most important thing because that's why you do these things. You're doing it for a bigger thing than yourself, like it's for something bigger than you. And I think a lot of that is why I kept training, why I kept going. Like I could have just stopped after, after rugby was finished. Oh, well, I can go do something else. But it felt like, you know, there's something bigger that you've got to work towards. I mean, if, if this is your identity, your identity is there, you're a thrower, you're, you're a Paralympian, you, you are going to inspire people. And that's, yeah, I think it's massive in the sport, massive. Sam Pierce has been described as one of the rare breed of leg spinners in the sport of cricket. A Cardiff Met student and captain of the cricket team is also on the verge of a professional career in one of the world's most popular sports. Cricket is big here, which is a bit like baseball. Cricket's an amazing game and, and we've got a number of players here who've, who've gone to play for England. England were playing Australia in the Ashes. It was one of the biggest series of all time and kind of everyone growing up around that point turned their heads, everything almost stopped and everyone had to watch it, including me. After seeing that, I think that was the sport I thought, oh, I want to play with that. I'd say around when I was 15, things started to get a bit more competitive. It was kind of one game where I was batting and I did pretty well. Me and another boy batted for a long time. And after I walked off, I thought, that, that doesn't happen every day. That was pretty special. So after that, I thought, maybe this is what I want to try and go into. And since then, I've put a lot more into it, a lot of time, a lot of effort. So when I was 18 in my last year of school, I decided that I wanted to take a year out. Got talking to some people and then I got an offer from a club in Australia to go and play uh, a summer of cricket out there. Australia, their national sport is cricket, I'd say. They're, they're one of the bigger countries in the world. But I thought that going out there and trying to play almost full time would help me. Going over there as a youngster and playing against uh, men, a bit tough, yeah, I really grew as a person. I knew a few people had come to this university and played on the MCC. Spoke to Mark, the coach. Spoke to a few other people I'd seen how successful they'd been. There's a really good system in place for players to come to university, study, get their degree, but also play at a high level, uh, which I think is really important because for people who might not make it professionally, they always have their degree there. I'm very passionate about students graduating. We have the programme at Cardiff with the cricket. A lot of students come here for the cricket, but the degree is paramount. Being in charge of a team, um, such a big team, such a good team, it just means quite a lot. It's good fun being a, being a leader almost. I thrive off it. I think it makes me play better. I've been involved with the scheme for about 12 years now, and I just see players, you know, that they've got the what it takes to go all the way um, and I see Sam as one of those players. I think he's respected, he delivers a goods so he, he performs well um, and I think he likes centre stage so he performs under pressure. A lot of players come to this university and play through this and then go on to play professional. Been on tour with Warwickshire last year, not signed as a professional um, but went on trial with them, he's just come back from India. 
being offered to go out there was really good. Something you can't turn down, you're learning from different cultures, uh, playing cricket uh, really intensely again, another thing that's going to help me progress hopefully. If it does go straight, at least it's going to go far, but the chance it goes straight is very unlikely. It's always just so intense training every day. Um, so you've got to find something to do that's just you can get away from it all, take your mind off everything. I'm trying to come on set day, twice, three times a week, yeah. You just get away from everything. Just chill out, hit some balls. Yeah, it's a nice thing to do in a spare time. Last one, you never want to finish on a bad one. Always finish on a good one. Keeps you in a good mood. That'll do. Well, it's good fun to get out here, really. Just being in uni all morning, come out here for an hour, take your mind off it, and go, <laughs> go and do it again. Not playing the main sport is hard because it gets overlooked, but to play cricket, especially uh, when it's a growing sport, means quite a lot. And especially, it's quite hard in terms of sport because it's massively rugby dominant and football after that. So to find sport like I have like cricket is was quite different to what was uh, the norm growing up. I think Sam's got potential to be a professional. Your performances have got to be solid and you've got to train hard and I suppose keep your focus but yeah I'm hopeful that Sam will be one of the players that could progress. If I have a good season then hopefully it takes a step towards uh, playing professionally. Get off to trial or get off to play a county team somewhere would be, be a lot but there's a lot of work to do before that. There's only one cricket team in Wales so if you ever got the chance to play for that as a Welsh person that would be I mean, quite a lot. It would be quite a special moment to a lot of Welsh people. Dr. Christian Edwards is the men's soccer coach at Cardiff Met and guided his team into the 2019 UEFA Europa League. Six months later, he collapsed on the pitch. I hadn't set out to get the World Premier League, I'd set out to change a football team. It was more about the process of the five years of being here. For us, you never arrive, you're always on a, on a journey, you're always on a, the destination is unknown for us. I just had a really good feeling, so I was calm, I was collected, but with everything that was then and this is now. And To say if you've been stabbed, I wouldn't know because I've never been stabbed, but it was just excruciating pain. So if there's an opportunity here to shape something, to make something that's mine, something I've probably never been able to do as a player, um, and, and I set about that. Uh, I upset a lot of people on the way. Um, I wanted to do things for the right things. Um, wanted the football club to have an identity. Wanted the football club to have a purpose. And um, uh, with that value and purpose and identity, it had to be based on being humble, um, being grounded, having values of hard work, um, because that's the ethos that was instilled in me as, um, from my manager at Swansea. He is a perfectionist and he develops everyone here at the club. and. The development that he's made in me is, is, is massive. Obviously he came from a professional environment himself um, and I think you know, he wanted to try and embed a professional environment here at, here at Cardiff Met. But he was able to change the culture, change the environment and a lot of us sort of came you know, along that journey and, and for him you know, starting back in, in Division 3, the fourth tier, um, actually going and getting into the Welsh Premier League was a fantastic achievement for us and then as soon as we were there, um, you know, we, we wanted to try, try and get European football. 
last season, I knew we'd get to the, the final again. And I knew when we got to the final, we'd win um, because we'd learnt. We hadn't regressed. And, and we always speak at the football club about on a, being on a journey. And, and you've never arrived, because lots of people say, I've arrived now. For us, you never arrive. You're always on a, on a journey. You're always on a, the destination is unknown for us. I knew that if this went to extra time, it'd be only one winner. Yes, the opposition had chances. Yes, we had uh, chances. Um, and it went to penalties. People say it's a lottery. I just had a really good feeling. So I was calm, I was collected, um, I, I watched the penalties being taken, um, I knew who, what order we were going in, I knew, the, um, I knew the way our goalkeeper prepared for the penalty shootout with the names of the players and which way they go on his bottle. So we were fully equipped, we prepared, there was no stone left unturned. If one person was going to ever take a penalty to take Cardiff men to Europe, um, then it was epitomised and the person would be Elliot Evans. And it's quite a surreal moment because the keeper went and it's as if like he'd given us the path to Europe and said, there you go, go the other side, and Elliot struck it. Um, there is clips of me rolling on the floor with uh, one of our coaches, uh, Di Bowen. I think it was it was probably sort of the summit and, and, and the point that we've been working towards for a long time. Um, so to actually achieve it, to get there, to play in the competition was, was pretty surreal to be honest. It was more about the process of the f five years of being here and I think it wasn't the moment that we got into the Europa League was, was the best part, it was just looking back and, and the process as a whole, um, how long it's been, um, how hard people have worked behind the scenes in Swanley, um, in Prof at the time um, and Becky getting us to Europe was, 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 was outstanding. It had been um, a, a product of 10 years, 11, 12, 12 years for me, but it wasn't something I'd set out to do. I hadn't set out to get the Welsh Premier League, I'd set out to, um, to change a football team. And within that football club we had a family, we had friends, and it just really was a little bit of an icing. I'd been struggling for a few weeks. I'd had pains in my chest for about um, four or five weeks and being the man thing that men do, don't say anything about it, don't talk about it. Um, I didn't think anything was wrong. Um, and on that particular Thursday, um, I came into work and I was teaching and I could feel a pain in my arm. And the pain was just a dull pain. And we were all telling them to go home, um, but the stubbornness of, of Swan, he was going, no, no, I'm staying here for training. So my assistant uh, Taff, he took, the, he took the majority of the session and I uh, just wanted to step in at the last bit to explain what I wanted from one of the players and um, I stepped in and he, he tried to provide this example and I hit the ball across the pitch and to say if you've been stabbed I wouldn't know because I've never been stabbed, to hit, be hit by lightning I don't know because I've never been hit by lightning um, but it was just excruciating pain. So we got told on the radio that someone had suddenly collapsed on the football pitch. Um, so we all ran out with uh, the defib and oxygen and all that sort of stuff. Called an ambulance and we thought he was having a heart attack. I was, I was just in shock. I thought he slipped over to be honest. Um, and I think after about five, five, six seconds you realised that he was on the floor um, suffering. I thought he was probably joking. Uh, he's you know, he's one to have a joke, have a laugh um, a lot of the time, so didn't really initially take it seriously. Um, and then obviously quite quickly realised, you know, he stayed down on the floor. Every time I breathed, I could, the, 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 my chest was getting tighter and tighter. And um, I was worried, got emotional for a couple of reasons. One, my children. Two, the fear of not seeing my children again. And three, my wife. Third, thirdly, probably as importantly, my wife. And apparently the players, his fellow players, were just devastated in the following week because they thought their coach was never going to coach him again. They thought, you know, the last thing anyone that has a, a heart issue wants to be doing is coaching a football team. Taken to hospital, 
36 hours later, still there, still freezing cold, still in the same clothes. My wife's next to me. I had a heart x-ray, chest x-ray, bloods, cardiograms, you name it, Instagrams, whatever you want to call them, I had them. And, um, and they diagnosed it as something that uh, of pericarditis was inflammation of the muscles around the heart, which was treatable. Yeah, it, it was pretty tough. We weren't sure, obviously, of the severity of it initially. We were in sort of regular contact with, with his family um, to sort of see how, how things progressed. It wasn't as severe as we first thought, which was, which was fantastic. The next game was the Saturday, it was live on telly and I was at home and I wanted to watch the game and uh, it was so frustrating. The remote control was in a thousand pieces by the end of the game and thrown it. Hardest thing though was not being in the dugout for a couple of weeks. Um, wasn't allowed in the dugout, had to stay away, that's my wife's annoyance. Probably a week, 10 days later, we saw him, he came in, uh, spoke to us, and then gradually started to integrate back in, and um, it didn't take long for him just to get back to his normal self. Within the month, he was back, which sums up the guy, he's a tough character, uh, and he loves football, he loves coaching, and it would take more than a heart attack to stop him coaching that team. To be fair, it was like he was never been away. Um, so say he wasn't even at training, he was always on the, on the group chat, messaging things, having messages, um, make sure messaging individual players as well, uh, make sure certain, certain things were being said. Um, and yeah, of course, it was nice having him back. It was a different aura, but it was also nice to have a break from him. And I think uh, we'd be the first one to tell him that. You know, it's, it, it wasn't the same without him, but he wasn't gone for that long. I'm fine now, I'm, I manage it, and uh, it's something that, interestingly, a lot of people have asked this week, how am I feeling? Yeah, fine, why shouldn't I? Oh yeah, if that happened, yeah, I forgot. So, I'm trying to put it in the back of my mind. And I suppose I could sit at home and mope and worry, and then worry even more. Um, whilst I don't want to go, whilst I'm scared of dying, um, you can't sit, sit there scared of dying and not do nothing. Um, so, you just have to get on with it. Jenny Nesbitt represents Great Britain and Wales as a talented distance runner. But as a teenager, the world-class athlete faced serious threats to her success. So I started running when I was about 12, 13 years old. I'd always been a really sporty kid, so I literally threw myself into any sport going, but it wasn't until, yeah, around 12 or 13 that I actually just ran for purely running sake. My parents kind of just installed in me that if you want something, go for it, and if it's what makes me happy and it's what I enjoy and it's what I want to achieve, I'm gonna to continue to do it until I've taken it as far as I feel I can. So I'm really lucky to be funded and supported by Wash Athletics. So it kind of all just fell into place. I moved to Cardiff about two years, two and a half years ago. The course here looked like something I'd really enjoy and they agreed to give me the flexibility to do it part time alongside my running. Jenny Nesbitt is on the Sport Broadcast Programme. She's doing it part time because she's a, an elite athlete. She's a scholar here. I can't believe how hard she works every day at training. Um, I can't believe how far she runs. I think it's the freedom and the fact that it's something that you put all your energy into. At the end of the day, it's you who kind of gets up, goes for a run and comes back. You get out of running what you put into it and I really, really like that. My parents split when I was 10 and my kind of nice little perfect life wasn't so perfect anymore. And at the time I think just all those different changes really kind of took its toll on me and it was almost like I didn't know which way to turn or what to do and I kind of thought that I kind of lost a lot of control. 
and I think it wasn't until I kind of moved to secondary school that I kind of turned to something that I felt could give me control and at the time that was controlling what I ate, controlling how much exercise I did and what my weight was and those were like three things at the time that no one else could kind of dictate and it was almost like an opportunity for me to be competitive with myself which looking back is a really messed way to be thinking and you know if I could change it now I would but at the time it was kind of like my only only way of coping. No one could really see from the outside how much I was struggling because I was very good at you know putting on a persona that kind of showed that I was happy and really enjoying life and I couldn't see the damage I was doing to myself. I had to battle every single day to you know put a fork of food into my mouth and I wasn't able to run, I wasn't able to do sport and for me that was a really big thing. We've only recently learned that she had some real difficulties when she was in her teens. She was struggling with various eating disorders and mental health problems, but sport was the thing that got her out of that. Sport, you could say, saved her life. Running saved her life. I was really lucky that my parents and my support system spotted the problem before it got to the point where I wasn't able to walk or my heart was failing. I'm really fortunate that I have a really strong network and people who kind of took it into their own hands to kind of save me. Things started to take a turn for the better probably a year later. I was kind of back at school. I was able to kind of put my trainers back on. I remember a really big day for me was competing for the team at the, we had like a school's cup and I was allowed to compete that day. Um, and my mum drove me down to London and we all raced. And I think I came like pretty far down the field, but at the time I didn't care. It was that kind of turning point that like, I was like, this is what I really love and I want to be able to do it. So I want to see how far I can take this and I'm going to channel this negative energy I've been channeling into destroying myself, into kind of seeing how great I could be as a runner. I think the lowest point in my career had to be around the age of 17. I'd finally kind of got everything straight and things were really looking up and I was running really, really well. I was, you know, one of the top runners in the country for my age group. I got struck down by an autoimmune disease. It was called Henoxia Lyme Purpura. It wasn't until I was literally on death's door that they kind of realised what was going on and gave me like the appropriate help and made me really, really quite ill and I wasn't able to run for two years. And it was a really, really low point in my life. And at the time, I was so weak and so frail, I think nobody could see me getting back to running. And it was almost like bomb two had come and hit me, you know? I'd grown up and I'd struggled and I'd got through it with so much help and support from everybody and then I was basically back to square one. I kind of, at that point, was like, wow, you can't take life for granted and it can be taken away from you at any moment in time, so I'm gonna do everything I can to achieve all my goals. It took me two and a half years and I kind of remember one day getting home from a run and seeing on the news that um, they were bringing a new race to my hometown in Worcester. And it was going to be a 10k road race and Paula Radcliffe 
who at the time was the current world record holder for the marathon, was going to come and be the key runner there, the star guest, and she was going to do the race. I kind of saw that and I was like, oh wow, that would be incredible to kind of run in the same race as Paula Radcliffe, and it's only like 200 metres from my house. So I really want to do it, and so two and a half years after I'd um, been admitted to hospital, I kind of stood on the start line, right next to Paula, the gun went and I raced. actually beat her on that day and I ran one of the fastest times as an under 20. Winning is just amazing, I didn't really, I came here today not expecting anything really, I've never done a 10k before so I just came out to have a bit of fun because I live so close, like I just thought oh why not and I, and I won and I'm just really happy about it. Even though I'd been through so much crap, I could still come out the other side and achieve something that, you know, realistically should probably not have happened. And I think, you know, your past doesn't have to define your future. Danny Nesbitt, congratulations with your third place here in Messer. How do you feel? Uh, I'm really, really happy. Um, I came here not really expecting anything. Um, so to get third, I'm really pleased with it. Um, and yeah, a great, great setup. Been really well looked after since we arrived, so it's been really, really good. Stories today that are seen with eating disorders and running are always shone in a negative light because one kind of feeds the other, and I can totally see that. But I think for me, running was this kind of thing I wanted to reach because I wanted to do well in it, and I knew deep down that to be good at running I had to be healthy and it was what I kind of woke up thinking and fighting for every single day. It's been amazing for her to share her story with us recently and with you guys and that's what we're all about really is trying to sort of tell these stories and maybe someone else will see that story who's a teenager who's going through similar problems but can use sport as a, as a way to help them. You don't want the help and you need it. And I think being brave enough just to ask somebody for a little bit of help is really important and it can do absolute wonders. You're gonna go through really dark days and you're gonna struggle and it's gonna be hard and it's gonna be unpleasant and uncomfortable. You're not gonna be able to get out of the hole you're in, but you will. It'll take a lot of mental toughness. It'll take a little bit of compromise, but it'll be 100% worth it you can evolve into whoever you want to be. So use that energy you've got in a positive way. Sam Gordon is the fastest man in Wales owning multiple records and sprinting towards the 2021 Olympic Games in Tokyo. Though always smiling, the elite runner's surge into the spotlight hasn't come without setbacks. Runner Sam Gordon. Sam Gordon. Uh, Sam Gordon, currently dubbed the fastest man in Wales. Sam Gordon, clearly feeling quite confident ahead of this final. Sam Gordon, electric out the blocks, already leaving the other athletes in his way. Yo, we just finished the final. Sam Gordon's miles ahead, good finish from McCoy and Gambagelli. 10 0 8. What a run from Samuel Gordon. That would be a Welsh record, a championship best. But Eco BB up on the wall right there. No complaints, just progress, you know, which is what we want. Here is Sam Gordon from Wales. People have written me off, people have doubted me, and like I said before, never doubt someone because you don't know what they're going through, you don't know what their mindset is. I don't want to be the fastest in the world, I don't want to be the fastest in the UK. I want to be one of the fastest in the world, do you know what I mean? I think it was always football when he was younger. Football was a big part of my life, so I grew up idolising Ronaldo. You saw that one standout player that literally was better than everyone else, was really flashy on the field, and I wanted to be that guy. On the school pitch, I would literally try and be flashy, strike the ball from as far as I could, do you know what I mean, just be that spectacular player. One of the big things I remember is that we used to play older guys because he was kind of advanced for his age. 
they let him play and he was able to hold his own. Being the quickest person on the field, the big target point would be get his ankles, get him out of the game. So literally I'd be training for athletics and then I'd get into a game, literally within the first 10 minutes, ankles bang, gone, ligaments damaged. And I just thought, if this is going to be every game, no, nope, not for me. I knew from basically day one that he was pretty fast. When I tell people about my life or my family, it's like, oh yeah, I've got, you know, I've got my brothers, it's like two older ones, one younger one, no, younger one's like, oh he's, yeah, he's like the fastest man in Wales or something, and people are like, huh? When my first ever competition, the PG was like, oh, let's try it, give it a go, and went there, won it, and I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. But that still didn't spark the interest. It was more so when I got into year 2013. I was struggling to decide whether I wanted to carry on with sport or get a real job. I literally gave all my all that one year to athletics. I was the European Juniors that year. I didn't make it, but came seventh in the trials. And I thought, oh, if I've put my head down for a year and worked really hard and I've achieved this, I should be able to achieve a lot more if I actually dedicate my life to this. Just this little ball of energy. He was like a young, quite scrawny kid. Pretty fast, but a little bit all over the place. Arms and legs flying all over the place. I just thought, if you tidy up what he's doing mechanically, then kind of get him a bit physically stronger, then he, he definitely had potential. It was pretty much like that. He was doing his life, and then without any time at all, he was just, just walking around, like a, you know, like a rock or something. When he started at university, he was going there for a little while and suddenly he walked through the door and I thought, <laughs> what's happened to you? <laughs> ah! Ah! Oh! Oh, I saw your, I knew your face was like, <laughs> When I came to Cardiff Met to do my studying, I joined my now coach, Matt Elias. And from then on out, we went to warm weather training camps in Arizona. So we were out there training. And then as a young athlete, that exposed me to very, very high quality athletes. Seeing how hard they were working and how hard they had to work day in, day out, that just showed to me what I kind of need to do to get to that level. Sometimes going outside and running, you don't, you don't want to, but my dad always said it's mind over matter when you, when you get to this level. And that's literally what I tell myself. So if I feel like I'm going to throw up, if I feel like I'm probably going to collapse on the floor because I'm exhausted, I literally just dial in. Just so that I know that when I get to the outdoors and start running, I know I've done all the work that I can do. Today they had kind of a big sort of either intensive tempo or, or lactate workout session. It's basically just pushing that body to a state where you're operating with lactate and it's almost like a bit of a burning sensation. Your legs start to feel burny, they start feeling really heavy. It almost looks like a bit like a war zone at the end, with bodies scattered everywhere. And when we get to those last reps, just getting yourself to the start line, not just build that physical strength, but kind of that mental strength needed as well. The International Olympic Committee has the honor of announcing that the games of the 32nd Olympiad in 2020 are awarded to the city of Tokyo. Yeah! When I found out that Japan would be holding this, like me and my mate, oh, we lost our heads. We were like, this is the games we're both going to make. And then we're going to make history because we, you went through school, teacher said, we're not going to be anything. You two are not going to make it. You're not going to make it in life. You're not going to make it for you and me. All this and that. And we literally just looked at each other and we went, we smiled. And they were like, oh, what are you laughing at? We're like, nothing. You don't need to, your opinion doesn't matter to us anymore. I remember that moment vividly. One of the only moments I remember like perfectly and me and Sam were standing there and we just looked at each other and smiled. They didn't like that, obviously, but we smiled because 
we knew what they were saying here wasn't going to demotivate us. It wasn't going to stop us from doing anything and we knew exactly where we wanted to go. One thing I'll never do with athletes is cut their dream short. I think you've got to dream big. British team won the World Championships two years ago, so that's going to be a squad of six or seven guys, whereas once you drill down into the individual team, it's three guys, and that's it. And I think for him to be in that top three, he's also going to need to be in the top 20 in the world as well. If you run sub 10, you are officially quick. That's just the holy grail of sprints. You can run other times and be quick, but that is quick. I've always said, the moment I think that I'm not going to make it, I'm not going to make it. I went through a pretty rough breakup with my ex-girlfriend, and I was down in the dumps, like, like we could say depressed, and basically it made me question everything about my life. I thought, am I even supposed to be doing this sport? Because if the person that I loved at the time couldn't see what I was doing, I might not do the right thing, do you know what I mean? He phoned me up really quite upset where I think he'd gone to try and patch things up with his partner at the time. It really blew up into this big thing. I was having so many injuries that year. I was like, I don't know if I'm in the, in the right sport. I probably, sports might even probably for me. So I literally went to World Champs and I said, if I don't run a PB and I don't win it, I am done. He was on the verge of sort of like stopping and, and quitting. I said, no, you know, you just got to try and get over this dark period. I was in a very low point. Make what you want of it. I was in a very, very low point. Very low point. Sam Gordon. Sam Gordon. Uh, Sam Gordon currently dubbed the fastest man. How many paracetamols does it take to kill someone? Literally, I remember I had them all lined up ready, just to just take the whole thing and just put them back. I don't want to be feeling like this no more. This is the only way out, do you know what I mean? It's hard to put into words like how, how you get there. I think it's just when you think your whole life's crashing down on you. I just don't want my parents to come in and, or my brother to come in and see a dead body in the bed. How will my parents feel when they're waking me up? Do you know what I mean? How will my brothers feel? How will all my friends feel? Like, just gone without a word. No one said a goodbye, nothing. And I'm just there. But luckily, they were there, they had my back. They were supporting me throughout the whole way. So in the end, obviously, I didn't feel like I needed to do that. It was like that was sucking the life out of him. And then all of a sudden, once those ties were cut, just that life came back and you saw the energy come back. So I literally went to Welsh Champs and I blew the field out of the water. And even though it was windy, I was like, it was just that sense of relief and just the pressure off my shoulders. And I literally looked at my coach and he just smiled. And I almost cried because I was like, I've been through so much over the past few months, like this whole year has been awful. And I just thought, right, I am, I am meant to be here and now I can start putting in the work. So that was that. He PB'd straight away and the rest of the season just kind of went like that. I think that was a big learning thing for him in his life as well. If he's happy and truly happy away from the track, that will bleed onto what he does on the track. Running and I don't even see you in my lane though. Running and do you, I don't even know your name, bro. Running, running again. Okay, guys, 10 seconds, match it out. Murder, he wrote, and all you see is the blood in the pen. Running down, and I don't even see you in my lane though. Running and do you, I don't even know your name, bro. Running, running again. I be setting the trend. Murder, he wrote, and all you see is the blood in the pen. Yo, <laughs> live. Sick. Sick day. Most recently, 
I didn't make the World Championships team for the Champs in Doha. The year just gone, and I remember I was in work, we were in a team meeting. And I was a bit down in the dumps anyway because I was like, oh, this season's just gone to pot again. I remember right on my phone and I realised that they announced the team. It was like, only crushed my soul because I was like, I've put in so much work this year. And I still haven't made the cut. Like, what more am I supposed to do? And I remember I stopped talking. I literally walked out of the meeting, went to my car and I just burst my eyes, I burst my eyes out crying. I was like, this is another year that I haven't made the grain, that I haven't made it. You start thinking about, oh, I've got a fiance, we wanna, we wanna buy a house, we wanna get married, and you start thinking, am I being selfish in trying to follow my dreams when other people are waiting on me to get somewhere? I feel like I'm holding people back. You start thinking, have I been selfish for so many years and I haven't realised? You start questioning yourself about if what you're doing is right. They said, look, use all of these negative things to actually enhance your, your running. I said, you know, when things maybe, even now when things are maybe just not going quite, quite how you want them to, you know, you, you've got to take that negative and build on it and use that you, I, to say, look, I've been here before, I've been through worse, actually. I had talks with, obviously, my family members, my fiancé, my friends, and they're like, you are doing the right thing, don't worry about what we're doing, like, you need to do this, we know you can do it. And having that support network behind me, has literally just fueled me, fueled me like well to try and get to where I know I can, I can be, which is the end of the games. It was about putting a plan in place. We've got a goal that's maybe six, eight, ten years, whatever it is, but we're planning that development along the way. And yeah, it hasn't been smooth sailing. There's been injuries, issues away from the track, but we're on plan and we're, we're going somewhere with it. He's not just one dimensional in terms of focusing on his athletics. I think he's an excellent role model. Up and down, you know, all the kids that he works with, they kind of look up to him. He's the best person that could possibly be around coaching children. He has as much energy as those children and he creates this environment that's just so motivational and positive that it's, it's one in a million. Seeing some of my friends that had less than what I had, I don't want them to ever feel like sport isn't the place for them. It will all be worth it in the end, mate. When I see kids now, I kind of want to inspire them as much as I can. It's supposed to be like an escape. As soon as you start enjoying it on the training, when you get to a race, you'll be exactly the same there. You have no worries when you're on the track. You don't have to worry about your day-to-day -day life. All you have to do is just have fun and run, do you know what I mean? It's as simple as that. You don't have to overcomplicate it. Just run as fast as you can, feel free. I've realised now you cannot doubt yourself in this game. Even if you don't back me, I don't care. I back myself and that's all that matters. I just need to buckle down and me and Matt, we're going to go to work. We're going to come back and we're going to hit the season as hard as we can. Just so it literally shows how serious we are because you can see the work that we put on is no joke. I believe people are going to know that outdoors straight away. If they don't know it now, they will know it. I know how good I am. I know how good I can be and I'm just trying to be the biggest and best athlete that's ever come out of Wales and made the Olympics. Don't ever write people off. Don't ever write people off because you don't know what monster it could, it could produce. Sport has a power to unite. We forget about our political differences and we forget about any of the tensions around the world, especially at this time in society, in Wales, in Britain, in Europe and in America where there's so many divisions. It's brilliant to see sport bring us all together as a sort of a, a common interest and a common love. Through difficulty and hardship, sport teaches us to overcome. And it unites. There's a saying in the Welsh language, be the hael and cardieto, the sun will rise again.
The Transatlantic Storytelling is an immersive learning global storytelling partnership between Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana and Cardiff Metropolitan University in Cardiff, Wales. For more information, visit transatlanticstorytelling.com.